This is Today with Derek Prince. The internationally recognized Bible teacher and author presents to you Keys to Successful Living. And now, here is Derek Prince. It's good to be with you again at the beginning of a new week, sharing with you keys to successful living which God has placed in my hand through many years of personal experience and Christian ministry. Let me begin by saying thank you to those of you who've been writing to me. Before I finish this talk, we'll be giving you a mailing address to which you may write. It means a great deal to me to hear how this radio ministry of mine has been helping you and blessing you. So please take time to write, even if it's only a brief note. In my talks this week, I want to speak about our personal relationship with God. In particular, I want to focus on one aspect of our character, which is essential for a right relationship with God, one which is seldom mentioned in contemporary Christianity and is little understood by most Christians. And yet, as I say, it's essential for a right relationship with God. If I were to give you three guesses, I'm sure that hardly any of you would come up with what I have in mind. The aspect of character that I'm going to deal with this week is the fear of the Lord. Does that produce some kind of negative reaction in you? The fear of the Lord? Do you almost shrink away from it as something stern and unattractive? If you will be patient and open-minded, I believe that I can show you in my talks this week that there is no element of character or Christian experience more to be desired and more rewarding than the fear of the Lord. I'd like to begin this study of the fear of the Lord with a beautiful jewel of Scripture tucked away in half a verse of Second Chronicles. You know, sometimes the most precious jewels of Scripture are hidden in little half-verses here and there. And unless we read carefully and attentively, we tend to pass them by and miss them. This half-verse is found in Second Chronicles 16, 9. The King James Version, which is very beautiful, says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The New International Version says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So God is looking for a man whom he can strengthen, whom he can stand by. But it's the eyes of the Lord that are running to and fro, or ranging throughout the earth, looking for such a man. What are we to understand by the eyes of the Lord? I believe the answer is to be found, amongst other places, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, where John the Revelator says, speaking about the vision that he had of heaven, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. An alternative translation is the sevenfold spirit of God sent out into all the earth. So when it says in Second Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro or ranging throughout the earth, looking for a certain kind of man, we're to understand that to mean that it's the Spirit of God that is out in the earth amongst all humanity, searching for a particular kind of person. Because when God finds that kind of person, he can do extraordinary things for him. So, what kind of a person is God looking for? I think it's important to bear in mind that, really, we don't have to coerce God into helping us or blessing us. Rather, we have to concentrate on being the kind of person that God is longing to bless and to help. God is looking for a certain attitude of the heart. What is that attitude? 
the scripture says, a heart that's perfect toward God. Or it says, those whose heart is fully committed to him. So, what we're talking about is a heart that's fully committed to God. That's perfect. The word perfect doesn't mean necessarily that you've arrived completely, but it means that every area of your heart is right in its attitude and relationship to God. That there's nothing in your heart that's being held back from God. There's no corner of your heart where you don't invite God's search and where you're not willing to open up to God and let Him show you what's pleasing to Him and what He expects of you. So we're thinking today of a heart perfect toward God, a total commitment to God that holds nothing back, that's unreserved. God's looking for a person like that. Would you like to be that kind of a person? I tell you, I would. I've walked with the Lord long enough to know that he's faithful, that if he lays down certain conditions and says that if we meet those conditions, he'll do certain things. I've always proved and experienced that when we meet the conditions, God fulfills his commitment. So, let's ask ourselves today, do we have a heart that's fully committed to God? Are we completely open with him? Is there any area of our heart or life that we're seeking to shield from God? Are there some rooms in the house of our heart where we haven't given God the key that we still want to occupy for ourselves? Some closet door somewhere that we've locked and said, God, you can walk through the rest of the house and inspect the rest of my rooms, but this closet, I just don't want you to see what's inside there. That's the kind of thing that God cannot fully bless. So the eyes of the Lord, the Spirit of God, is ranging throughout the earth, looking for a person who has no locked-off areas, no secret dark corners, no reservations, nothing that's unyielded. What is the essence of that kind of attitude? I believe it's summed up in that phrase we're thinking of, the fear of the Lord. What are we to understand by the fear of the Lord? I believe the fear of the Lord centers in the first commandment. The first commandment, as it's given in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, is like this. The Lord speaks to his people. I am the Lord, your God. You shall have no other gods before or beside me. Many of us that have grown up in a church background were so familiar with that commandment or the concept of it that I think sometimes we pass it by without considering all that's involved. We are not to have any other God before or beside him. There is to be nothing in our life that's placed on the same level as God. God's position in our hearts and lives must be absolutely unique. He will not share the throne with anything in our heart. There's a very striking phrase found in Genesis 31, verse 42. Jacob is speaking to his father-in-law Laban. We don't need to go into the background. They're having a kind of dispute. And uh, Jacob is saying, if God hadn't taken care of me, you would have cheated me. This is what he says. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. Notice that phrase, the God of Abraham, and then the fear of Isaac. In the text I have before me, the word fear is printed with a capital F. It's a name of God. The fear of Isaac is Isaac's God. And Isaac, of course, was the father of Jacob. Ponder on that. What you fear is your God. There's a kind of fear that makes what you fear your God. This works both ways. If you fear the true God, he's your God. But if you fear the wrong thing, then you make that thing your God. Have you met people that are absolutely obsessed by fear of some particular thing? Might be cancer. I don't want to be uncharitable, but in a certain sense, some people have such a fear of cancer that they almost make cancer their God. Remember what you fear in that sense, is your God. 
And this fear of the Lord and this attitude toward God leaves no room for neutrality. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13, the wisdom of God is speaking. And the wisdom of God says this, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. You see, there's no neutrality in this realm. If you fear the Lord, then you must hate evil. You cannot compromise with evil. The fear of the Lord dictates a very strong attitude against evil. A person who tolerates and compromises with evil is lacking in the fear of the Lord. Particularly, wisdom declares we must renounce three things. Pride and arrogance, a wrong attitude. Evil behavior, wrong behavior. And perverse speech, wrong speech. These are three things that are inconsistent with wisdom and with the fear of the Lord. A wrong attitude, wrong behavior, and wrong speech. Well, let's ask God to open up the fear of the Lord to us as I continue with this theme for the rest of the week. It's good to be with you again as I continue to share with you on a theme of tremendous personal importance for each of us, the fear of the Lord. In my introductory talk yesterday, I established three important points. First, God's Spirit is searching the whole earth for a person with a certain attitude of heart. This attitude is described as a heart that is perfect toward God or a heart that is fully committed to God. Second, wherever God finds such a person, it is his purpose to strengthen that person or to strongly support him or to show himself strong on his behalf. Third, one essential mark of a person with this kind of attitude toward God is the fear of the Lord. However, this phrase, the fear of the Lord, tends to produce some kind of negative reaction in us. We almost shrink away from it as something stern and unattractive. One reason for this kind of negative reaction is that we unconsciously confuse the fear of the Lord with other kinds of fear that are unpleasant and often also harmful. Therefore, in my talk today, I'm going to deal with these other forms of fear, fears that are unpleasant and harmful. I'm going to identify them and show how they differ from the kind of fear which is beneficial and pleasing to God, that is, the fear of the Lord. I believe there are four main kinds of fear that we experience that are unpleasant and harmful, that are not the fear of the Lord. So I'm going to speak now briefly about each of these four kinds of fear. The first kind I would call natural fear. It's something that we all experience. It's part of human nature. There are times when we get afraid. I get afraid. You get afraid. Let me give you just a few simple examples. One that's always very vivid to me is being at the top of the roller coaster. You see that long swoop that's going to go down there and you start down it and you feel you've left your stomach somewhere about 50 yards behind you and the muscles of your stomach just tense. That's a very strong kind of fear. I don't know why people go back over and over again to experience the same thing. I suppose really what they appreciate is having the fear and then finding there was nothing to be afraid of. Personally, actually, I've really lost interest in going on roller coasters. That's just by the way. But that's a fear that most of us have experienced. Another source of natural fear is thunder and lightning. There are a few people who haven't been scared at one time or other in their lives by a loud peal of thunder or a sudden flash of lightning. As a matter of fact, even animals like dogs tend to fear that. Another kind of fear which I have experienced too myself is the fear of a soldier in battle. You're lying there and the bullets are whistling over your head about three inches above you, and you know if they were three inches lower, that would be the end of you. And there are not many people that haven't experienced fear in that situation, or it could be a civilian under aerial bombardment, such as the cities of Europe experienced in World War II. 
And I remember being in London, England, the first night the air raid sirens sounded there, and being there subsequently in some of the bombardments. Even the sound of that siren produced a kind of convulsion inside you, a tensing of all your muscles. So those are kinds of natural fear. They're not necessarily evil, but they're certainly not the kind of fear that we're talking about that God is looking for. The second kind of fear I would call demonic or tormenting fear. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. In Romans 8.15, Paul says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Paul is here contrasting the spirit of God that assures us that we are God's children with another kind of spirit. He calls it a spirit that makes you a slave or a spirit of slavery to fear. That's not just something purely natural. That is something in the spiritual realm. And its result is slavery. One thing we know is that God never produces slavery in his children. He doesn't want slaves. He wants sons. So that kind of fear that produces slavery is not the fear of the Lord, and it's not good. In uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7, Paul also speaks about a kind of spirit that's not from the Lord. He says, But God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. The mark of the Holy Spirit is power, love, and self-discipline or self-control. Any spirit that doesn't have those marks is not the Holy Spirit. And Paul is contrasting with it a spirit of timidity. The King James Version calls it a spirit of fear. This is one of the commonest spiritual problems of Christians. In my ministry, I've seen hundreds of Christians who needed to be delivered from this spirit of fear. Now, these are wrong spirits. They're not the Spirit of God. They're not what we're talking about under the heading of the fear of the Lord. How would we identify them? One of the key words, I believe, is torment. In 1 John 4:18, John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. See, there's a kind of fear which is tormenting, and that's not from God. That's evil. If I were to choose other words to identify this evil spirit of fear or timidity, I think the words would be something like these, unnatural, unreasonable, obsessive, binding, enslaving. Those are the marks of that kind of spirit of fear. There are many, many manifestations. For instance, two things, to use long medical terms, claustrophobia and agoraphobia. Claustrophobia means fear of being shut up in a confined space. Many people experience that. My first wife suffered with it for years. Then one day... We identified it as an evil spirit. She claimed deliverance from the Lord, and after that she was a different person. Before that, I always had a problem getting her into an elevator. She'd rather walk up four flights of stairs. After she was delivered from that spirit of fear, she was perfectly content to go up in the elevator. That's an example. Another example that's often demonic is fear of the dark. We find people who are unable to sleep without a light. In most cases, that's the result of occult involvement. And then another kind of Demonic fear is fear of specific creatures, cats, birds, or bees. I've seen some remarkable cases. I knew one young woman who was just desperately afraid of bees. Her whole life was controlled by determination never to be near bees. She was a highly educated, very talented young woman. Gradually, this thing came to the light. She was delivered from it. Next day, she was eating lunch in front of an open window. A bee flew into the dining room flew right around her head and flew out again, and she didn't budge. She realized she'd been delivered. Well, all those are kinds of fear that are not the fear of the Lord. They're demonic, and we have to distinguish them. The third kind of fear that is not the fear of the Lord and is not good is what I would call religious fear. Uh, Isaiah speaks about this, Isaiah 29:13. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That's what I call a kind of religious fear. It's conformity 
because of rules, because of demands, because of a fear that if you don't do that, you won't be counted as one of the good people. And the the important thing to see about it is it doesn't bring a person's heart near to God. The people that Isaiah speaks about had this religious fear, but at the same time their heart was far from the Lord. Jesus challenged the religious leaders of his day with that kind of fear. In fact, he quoted Isaiah at them in Matthew 15, 7 through 9. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. I call that rigid religious conformity, not motivated by genuine love of God, but by fear of being different. I would say that typically religion seeks obedience through fear. And the kind of obedience it achieves is not hard obedience. It isn't a hard attitude that God welcomes, that's right with God, that's pleasing in his sight. And remember, we're talking about the fear of the Lord as that which produces the right heart attitude toward God. That kind of religious fear is often associated with the kind of fear I spoke about just before, the spirit of slavery to fear, religious fear. All right, the fourth kind of fear that is not from God and is not the fear of the Lord is what I just call fear of man. This too is spoken about in Scripture. Proverbs 29:25. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. You see that the fear of man here is contrasted with trusting in the Lord. So this is a kind of fear that does not cause us to trust in the Lord. Therefore, it is not good. I think you could express it this way. It's a kind of fear that makes man seem bigger than God. So when you measure man's opinion against God's opinion, man's opinion seems more important. And it leads to disobeying God. You see, the fear of the Lord will never lead to disobeying God. That's one sure distinguishing mark. So examine yourself. Ask yourself. As we think about the fear of the Lord, do I have the right kind of fear or are the wrong kinds of fear binding me and holding me and keeping me from being the kind of person that God wants me to be? Well, our time is up for today, but I'll be back with you again tomorrow at this time. Tomorrow I'll continue with this theme of the fear of the Lord. I'll be showing you how the fear of the Lord was manifested in the life of Jesus himself and how it should be manifested also in our lives. It's good to be with you again as we follow through our theme for this week, the fear of the Lord. In my talk yesterday, I discussed certain kinds of fear which we commonly experience, but which are not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is beneficial and pleasing to God, but these other forms of fear are unpleasant and often harmful. I mentioned specifically four other kinds of fear. First, what I call natural fear, the fear you get on the roller coaster, or the fear of thunder and lightning. I think we've all experienced fear like that. Second, what I call demonic fear. The mark of that is that it's unnatural, unreasonable, obsessive, enslaving. Perhaps the key word is torment. I mentioned such things as claustrophobia and unreasoning fear of animals and many different kinds of fear. The third kind, religious fear, what I call religious conformity, not motivated by genuine love of God. In fact, the people that have that kind of fear, their hearts are far from the Lord. And fourthly, fear of man, a fear that makes man seem bigger than God where you have to choose between man's opinion and God's opinion, you're swayed by man's opinion. That's the fear of man, and it leads to disobeying God. One sure thing about the fear of the Lord is it never leads to disobeying God. Well, in my talk today, I'm going to return to the positive kind of fear, the fear of the Lord. And I'm going to explain how the fear of the Lord was manifested in the life of Jesus himself and how it should be manifested also in our lives. I want to turn, first of all, to a prophetic preview of the Messiah found in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Almost all scripture commentators agree that this is a preview of the Messiah. 
A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. For that last phrase, the Jerusalem Bible says, the fear of Yahweh, that's their version of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is his breath. To understand this passage fully, I believe we need to compare it with Revelation 5, 6, where John the Revelator, speaking of his vision of heaven, says this, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And an alternative translation says, which are the sevenfold Spirit of God. So we see that the Spirit of God has seven primary forms or manifestations. And these are the forms that are mentioned here in this prophecy of the Messiah, which was fulfilled in Jesus. Let's look at those seven forms of the Spirit of God again, all of which rested on Jesus. First, the Spirit of the Lord. That's the Spirit that speaks in the first person as God. Now, the remaining six forms are mentioned in couples. The Spirit of Wisdom and the Spirit of Understanding. The next couple, the Spirit of Counsel and the Spirit of Power. The third couple, the Spirit of Knowledge and the Spirit of the Fear of the Lord. Do you know, my reaction as I read that and think about it is this. How dangerous to have knowledge without the fear of the Lord. How many people have been destroyed by knowledge because it wasn't combined with the fear of the Lord. Now, the prophecy of Isaiah particularly focuses on that last aspect and says he will delight in the fear of the Lord, or the fear of the Lord is his breath. We need to take this to heart, that when this revelation is given of Jesus as the Messiah and the Holy Spirit coming upon him, Though all seven forms of the Holy Spirit are specified, the particular form that is emphasized is the form of the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. How important that makes it. Let's see briefly how this was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, the writer of Hebrews is speaking about the days of Jesus in his flesh, in his earthly ministry, and he says this, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Notice what gave Jesus always access to the Father. Why were his prayers always heard? Because of the fear of the Lord. That's what commended him in a unique way to the Father. An alternative translation of that verse says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, And he was heard because of his reverent submission. That's what we're talking about. Reverent submission. Complete yielding to the will of God. Of course, this was expressed in the earthly life of Jesus, primarily or chiefly at Gethsemane. You remember when he had to pray and yield his will to the will of the Father. We read this in Matthew 26, 39. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And again, in verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. See, that's the fear of the Lord. Never do we assert our will against the will of God. Never do we put anything else in our lives on a level with God. It's God unique, supreme, first and foremost. That's the particular attitude of heart that was manifested always in the life of Jesus. That's the attitude of heart that God is looking for in the men and women that he particularly wants to bless and to strengthen. Let me make this observation. If Jesus needed the fear of the Lord, how much more do you and I need it? Now I want to speak about the fear of the Lord in the life of God's people, in us as believers. I want to say, first of all, that God expects both honor and fear from his people. Malachi 1.6, God says to his 
A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then, if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? But the word that's translated respect is literally the word for fear. So there's a kind of fear that God requires from his people. And if we do not give it to him, we're lacking in that attitude toward God. And then we read an account of the early church in the ninth chapter of Acts, at a time when God's favor and blessing was upon the church. This is what it says. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. I'm deeply impressed by that combination, the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and that's what brought growth in the church. See, we easily become one-sided. We've received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. We know a new kind of liberty and joy and power, but we don't combine it with the fear of the Lord and we get one-sided and there's a lack of real holiness and reverence and depth in our spiritual life. Let's make a resolution that we'll go on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And then the fear of the Lord is needed to motivate us rightly in our attitude toward one another. In Ephesians 5, Paul is speaking about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And he goes on to say that it will be expressed in our relationship to one another. So he says in verse 21, Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Then the next verse, of course, speaks about wives being subject to their husbands. I remember talking to a pastor once, a well-known successful pastor. He described how he and his wife were having what he described as a church fight in their bedroom. And he was saying, You don't respect me, you don't submit to me. And she was saying, well, I'm not sure that I'm prepared to. And he said, why not? And she said, well, you don't have too good a record. And he said they were just about to have a real quarrel, and it was like a cold wind blew into their bedroom and reminded them, submitting to one another in the fear of God, reminding them that it wasn't their choice or decision. It was the motivation of the fear of God. They both dropped to their knees on either side of the bed and repented. Why should we fear? Let me give you one tremendous reason for us as Christians. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. And if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each man's word, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. See, that's one great motivation for always living in the fear of the Lord, to think of the price that God had to pay for our redemption. May it never be that we grieve him or that we ever indicate we don't appreciate the price that God paid. Let me read in closing a verse from Psalm 2, verse 11. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Another translation says with fear. See, that's the combination. It's not one or the other. It's rejoicing with trembling. Whenever we get to just one or the other, we get one-sided. When it's all just rejoicing or when it's all just trembling, we're one-sided. We need the fear of the Lord to keep us in spiritual balance. Our time is up for today, but I'll be back with you again tomorrow at this time. Tomorrow I'll continue with this theme of the fear of the Lord. I'll be describing the special blessings we receive as we cultivate the fear of the Lord in our lives. It's good to be with you again as we continue with our theme, the fear of the Lord. Yesterday we looked at the prophetic preview of Jesus as the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 2 and 3, where it says this, And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. We see there the sevenfold fullness of the Holy Spirit, the seven aspects of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And the particular aspect which Isaiah emphasizes in that prophecy is the last one. That's the only one that there's any additional comment on. It says, He, the Messiah, Jesus, will delight in the fear of the Lord. This was the seventh 
and culminating form of the fullness of the Holy Spirit manifested in Jesus. Now the New Testament makes it clear that the Holy Spirit will likewise impart the same fear of the Lord to all believers whom he conforms to the image of Jesus. We cannot really claim to be conformed to the image of Jesus if this aspect of the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord, is not in us. This will be manifested both in the corporate life of the church and in the individual life of each believer. We saw examples of that yesterday. Today I'm going to go on to speak about the special blessings we receive as we cultivate the fear of the Lord in our lives. I don't know of any aspect of the spiritual life which carries with it more precious and wonderful blessings than the fear of the Lord. This is something that I've meditated in over many years. I just pray that I'll be able to share it with you in such a way that you'll desire what I'm talking about. So we're going to look at some of the blessings which are directly associated in Scripture with the fear of the Lord. The first blessing is wisdom. And this is emphasized again and again in the Scripture. For instance, in Job 28, 28, To man God said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding. So the essence of true wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And we notice, as we saw before, that there's never neutrality with the fear of the Lord. It demands that we depart from evil. We cannot compromise with evil and have the fear of the Lord. Then in Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We cannot even start to have true wisdom until we have the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The implication is clear that anyone that lacks the fear of the Lord is a fool. And in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We need to distinguish between wisdom and certain things that are sometimes confused with it, like cleverness or education. It's possible to be clever, but to be a clever fool. It's possible to be educated, but be an educated fool. I was in educational work teacher training in East Africa for five years. I discovered a tremendous hunger amongst the African people for education. But I had to remind them at times, it's one thing to be educated, it's another thing to be wise. I actually told them, an educated mind is a wonderful thing, it's like a sharp knife but it can be used for good or evil. One man may use that sharp knife to cut up meat or bread for his family. Another man may use an identical knife to kill his neighbor. There's no difference in the knife. It's the use that it's put to. Wisdom enables us to make the right use of education. And wisdom is not to be found apart from the fear of the Lord. Then the fear of the Lord brings spiritual cleansing. Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Notice that. There's never going to be an end to the fear of the Lord. It's going to go on forever and ever, not just through this life, but through eternity. It endures forever, and it's clean. To me, the fear of the Lord is like an antiseptic. It keeps away that which is impure, that which is harmful. It kills the destructive, corrupting influences that surround us in the world today. The fear of the Lord is a clean fear. It's a pure fear. It produces moral and spiritual cleanliness. Then the fear of the Lord produces guidance, instruction, and prosperity. Listen to that list. Guidance, instruction, prosperity. Listen to Psalm 25, verses 12 through 14. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. You see, a person that fears the Lord, God will teach him the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity. And even beyond that, to those that fear him, the Lord will reveal the secrets of his covenant. You see, all the wonderful secrets of God, all his provision for his people, are locked up in his covenant. The whole Bible consists of two covenants, the new covenant and the old covenant. 
Now, covenant is one of God's secrets, and he doesn't reveal it except to those who fear him. And so, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you're like somebody on the outside looking in. You can see the demonstrations of God's power. You can see that God is at work. You can even experience God's working in your own life. But the real secret of what's going on, the inner understanding, is withheld from you. You see, people can be enrolled in any college, even in a theological college, go through all the grades, pass all the examinations, get the degrees, and never have been enrolled in God's school because God chooses his students on the basis of character. And the first thing he looks for in those whom he is going to teach is the fear of the Lord. Let me read those words to you again. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. Do you want to be taught by God? Do you want to share God's secrets? Do you want to know the innermost depths of his covenant? The real place of the hiding of God's power and purposes? You must cultivate the fear of the Lord. The way is closed against those who have not cultivated the fear of the Lord. This is the password. This is the key that brings us into this inner relationship where we know the secrets of God's covenant. The next great blessing that flows from the fear of the Lord is a long and a good life. Actually, there are many passages in the Bible where good life is associated with the fear of the Lord. Let me read to you from Psalm 34, verses 11 through 14. Come, you children. God is speaking to his children. Come, you children. Listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? and loves length of days, that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And again in Proverbs 10, 27, there's this promise. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Let's go back to the passage in Psalm 34 for a moment. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You see, the fear of the Lord has to be taught. God teaches it to his children if we're willing to be taught. I believe we also have a responsibility to teach the fear of the Lord to our children if we're parents. If we're pastors or spiritual leaders, I believe we have a responsibility to teach the fear of the Lord to the people of God. It is something that has to be taught. But what follows in its train? Who is the man who desires life? Loves length of days that he may see good. Life, length of days, and good days. I remember my first wife often used to say, what's the good of living a long life if it isn't a good life? It's just so many more years of misery. But God gave her both a long and a good life. She was a woman in whom the fear of the Lord was one of her distinguishing characteristics. I want to tell you this works. As always, this psalm indicates that The fear of the Lord forbids any compromise with evil. It goes on to say, Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. You cannot cultivate the fear of the Lord and compromise with evil. Then another tremendous blessing that flows from the fear of the Lord is deliverance from other fears. Proverbs 14, verses 26 and 27. In the fear of the Lord... There is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, that one may avoid the snares of death. Meditate in those words. In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. You see, it doesn't make you a fearful person. It takes fearfulness away from you. When you cultivate the fear of the Lord, you're delivered from other fears. You have strong confidence. You have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. It's a pure fountain of clean water that proceeds direct from God. It brings life, brings health, brings peace, brings prosperity, it brings assurance. I don't know of any single aspect of the spiritual life or moral character that carries with it greater blessings than the fear of the Lord. I want to suggest to you, meditate in these scriptures. Make a note of them. Read them through for yourself. Ponder on them. 
and then say, Lord, please teach me the fear of the Lord. I'll be a willing pupil. All right, our time is up for today. I'll be back with you again tomorrow at this time. Tomorrow I'll continue with this theme, the fear of the Lord. We've not yet come to the end of the precious and wonderful blessings that flow from the fear of the Lord. It's good to be with you again as we draw near to the close of another week. Today I'm going to continue and conclude the theme that I've been dealing with all week, the fear of the Lord. Yesterday I began to describe the special blessings we receive as we cultivate the fear of the Lord in our lives. I actually spoke of five such blessings. The first, wisdom. And we saw that wisdom and the fear of the Lord can never be separated. The second, spiritual cleansing. I suggested that the fear of the Lord is a kind of spiritual antiseptic that kills the things that would corrupt our life. The third, guidance, instruction, prosperity. Particularly, I pointed out that the Lord chooses his pupils. He chooses them on the basis of a character requirement. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him, God will teach. The fourth, a long and a good life. It's not enough to have a long life if it's not a good life. It's just so many more years of misery. But the fear of the Lord bring both a long life and a good life. And fifth, deliverance from all other fears. Now, if there were no other blessings besides these, it would surely be foolish not to desire and to cultivate the fear of the Lord. But the fact is that there are yet other blessings. On top of these I've already mentioned, that flow out from this one fountain, the fear of the Lord. You remember I read yesterday, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. It's a fountain of life that produces multitudinous blessings. Today we're going to look together at some of these additional blessings that I didn't mention yesterday. Most of these scriptures are found in the book of Proverbs. The next blessing I'm going to mention, I've defined this way. Abiding satisfaction and freedom from evil. The verse that I'm going to read now, I think, is one of the most astonishing verses in the Bible. I just marvel that people can read the Bible and pass it by. Proverbs 19:23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Did you know that it was possible to have that kind of a life? The King James Version is beautiful. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. How many people do you know who abide satisfied? Who are never disturbed, never lose the victory, never overcome by depression or negative emotions. They abide satisfied. They're peaceful, secure people. It's not that they don't have problems and temptations, but they have something in them that gives them additional strength and peace. It's the fear of the Lord. Let me read that King James Version again. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Let me ask you, do you have it? Do you abide satisfied? The next blessing I want to mention is riches, honor, and life. Proverbs 22, 4. Humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. Any one of those things would be desirable, but think of the combination of the three, wealth, honor, and life. I expect you've noticed as we've been going through this study the continued repetition of the word life in association with the fear of the Lord. Then, another blessing security, and an assured future. Proverbs 23, 17 and 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners, because there's nothing in their lives to be envied, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. That's good counsel. Live in the fear of the Lord always. Cultivate it. Walk in it. Let it be the way you look at everything. Let it be the basis of your evaluation of what you do. Live in the fear of the Lord. Don't envy sinners. There's nothing that they have 
that you'll need if you walk in the fear of the Lord. Surely there's a future. Your hope will not be cut off. You have an assured future. You don't need to be concerned about what lies ahead. God is going to take care of you. He has a plan for you. He has a place for you. Not just in eternity, but in time. God is going to take care of those who live always in the fear of the Lord. I've been speaking of the multitudinous blessings that flow from the fear of the Lord. To close my talk, I want to deal with a very important and practical question. How can we achieve the fear of the Lord? I want to suggest to you that primarily it comes from a decision. Very often in the Christian life we attach too much importance to our emotions. We let our emotions dictate to us. But the important things in the Christian life come as a result of decision, not of emotion. They spring from the will. And very often, if we're too conscious of our emotions and their pressures, we don't make the right decisions with our will. Our decisions are blurred and fuzzy. It takes a clear, sharp, firm decision of the will to cultivate the fear of the Lord. It begins with a decision. I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage from the first chapter of Proverbs that brings out this point, as you'll see as I read. In this uh, passage, wisdom, the wisdom of God, is speaking to men. I'm going to begin at verse 24 and read through verse 33. But since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice, and would not accept my rebuke. This is wisdom, chiding man with rejecting. Then God says in the person of wisdom, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and troubles overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke. They will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Did you notice the words that I emphasized there in the middle where wisdom says they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord? The Hebrew says literally did not choose the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord comes by a choice. It comes by a decision. It doesn't just happen. It isn't an accident. It isn't a thing that some people are born with and some people are not born with. It's not like the color of your hair. It's something that depends on your decision. You see, when God speaks in the person of wisdom, he offers such attractive inducements. At the end of that passage, he says, whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. We've seen that all along. This is the kind of life that's promised to those who cultivate the fear of the Lord. But we have to choose. We have to make a decision. I believe this decision is the watershed of a human life. On one side, there's peace, security, abiding satisfaction, length of life, honor. On the other side, there's frustration, fear, pressures, an inability to cope, an uncertainty about the future, anxiety, neurosis, all sorts of things that eat away at human life and destroy human personality. Which side of that watershed are you going to live on? Are you going to choose the fear of the Lord? I want to return in closing to that first commandment in Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me or beside me. 
I said earlier in my talks, I believe this is the essence of the fear of the law. It's the decision that we make in our personal relationship with God. You are my God. There is nothing in life that I'll put on the same level with you. There's nothing that will challenge your right to my will, to my obedience. I'm making you absolutely and without question my God. I believe the decision can be expressed in words spoken to God. We can say to God, Lord, you are my God. I will worship you, serve you, obey you. You shall have first place in every area of my life. Would you like to make that decision? Would you say those words after me if I repeat them? Lord, you are my God. I will worship you, serve you, obey you. You shall have first place in every area of my life. Amen. So be it. Our time is up for today. I'll be back with you again next week at the same time, Monday through Friday. Next week we'll look together at another rich and exciting theme from the inexhaustible treasury of Scripture. If you would like to study this theme of the fear of the Lord more fully in the quietness of your own home, with opportunity to go back over points of special interest to you, all my five talks this week on the fear of the Lord are available in a single carefully edited 60-minute cassette. Also, this week I'm making a special offer of my book, The Grace of Yielding. In simple and practical terms, this book explains one important way in which you can cultivate the fear of the Lord in your own life. The announcement that follows will tell you how to obtain both the cassette and the book. For your copy of the book, The Grace of Yielding, just send a tax-deductible contribution to Derek Prince, Box 300, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33302. That's Derek Prince, Box 300, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33302. You have been listening to a series of talks entitled The Fear of the Lord. Talks originally heard on the daily radio program Today with Derek Prince. We'll be happy to send you additional information on other programs currently available, as well as a catalog of teaching tapes and books. This radio ministry is supported by your prayers and your financial contributions. Derek Prince also welcomes your letters and your prayer requests.